First thing to say is that um, before I started, I'd actually hoped that an audience of 800 would blur for me and that I wouldn't be able to see people properly. But unfortunately, I can see you all. So it's quite daunting um, having to, to do this. Um, I'm from an organization called the Studio Schools Trust. And I'm going to tell you about a new type of school that we started in England. Perhaps the first thing, though, to do is to, to provide a bit of context about um, why, um, why studio schools at all. And we've heard earlier about um, factory schools, or the factory, the factory model. Um, in England, um, universal education, that is education up to the age of 13, was introduced um, in 1870. Lots of people were opposed to the idea. Um, they were opposed because of the feeling that if the working classes were to um, become educated, they would become dissatisfied with their lots. They would be unhappy about, about their, their status. Um, there were, though, good moral grounds for, for introducing universal education. Many people thought morally it was the right thing to do. But the two things that actually got political impetus behind it were... Um, the success of the Prussian army. I don't know if many of you have done European history, but um, in the 1860s and 1870s, um, the Prussian army were pretty much sweeping all before them. They were unifying Germany at the point of the bayonet. And that, the, the thinking in Britain was that was partly because they had an educated army. Um, the Prussians had introduced universal education at a much earlier stage. So there was a fear that militarily we were going to be left behind. The main reason, though, was what were industrialists saying. In 1870, Britain was much the largest industrial economy in the world. Um, it had industrialised early and it industrialised relatively fast. Um, industrialists were worried that they were going to lose their place to people like the Prussians and the Americans because they had... Um, introduce education for all. Now, by education for all, they simply meant the ability to read and to write, but actually more than anything else, they meant discipline. We always think of the Victorians as being very disciplined, but actually early Victorian society was wild. It was a violent society. Um, the working classes were not the disciplined, regimented groups that, that we came to see later on. So the purpose of, of education was to prepare people to work in these factories. 140 years later, um, what do we have? Well, in many ways, you've got a very similar education model. Um, teaching's evolved, technology's been introduced, you know, classes have whiteboards, they have all sorts of things um, that nobody properly uses, but um, they've, got, they've got them nonetheless. But essentially, it's done the same way. You have young people sitting in rows the way that you're all sitting in rows, and somebody standing up front and telling them you know, about, about something. Um, that model has been compromised even more, though, because um, schools in, in the United Kingdom are driven by the need to achieve better qualifications. If you have a labour market which has shifted and ceased to depend on cheap labour, which is what that early industrial model required, um, and actually requires a set of skills, politicians have made a horrible mistake. They've thought that qualifications were the same as skills. Well, well clearly they're not. There's some overlap, but actually the skills that employers are looking for are quite different from the qualifications that, that we teach. We have, I, I keep looking around here and discovering to my horror that I can't read Portuguese, um, but uh, it is down here in English. Um, the uh, measurement systems we have in place um, stifle innovation. We've got 150 years of infrastructure investment in measuring um, achievement against qualifications. Nobody's going to abandon that very easily because it allows you to um, link um, how this cohort is doing with the cohort from a year before or five years or ten years before that. The fact that those um, qualifications are becoming less and less relevant doesn't matter. The system has a life of its own. Inertia is taking it forward. But, but 
But actually, what we are now seeing is that um, employers are demanding change. Employers want to see a, a different education system. They're not really um, too bothered about the, the technical knowledge that, that young people have, because actually they'll often teach that themselves. What they're concerned about is, do they have the social and interpersonal skills to fit in in a modern workplace? And schools simply aren't teaching any of that. What we've done with studio schools really was, um, well, two things. One, we realised we're not going to change the system. There are, um, I mean, Britain, it's not a big country compared to Brazil, but there are 60 million people living in, in Britain. There are 3 million children in the secondary education system. You're not going to make changes like that to, to a system like that very quickly. You don't make system-wide changes um, unless you're in North Korea. You know, you can't just stand up and say, teachers will now teach this way or they'll be short. You know, it just won't happen. Um, so we decided we had to, to pilot something ourselves. And we used a model that was much more common three or four hundred years ago. In Europe, the idea of the, um, the uh, studio where you went to, to live and learn. Um, some of you will recognise um, the drawings there from Leonardo da Vinci, and, and that's really where some of this inspiration came from. So, studio schools, I'll just go through this bit of it fairly quickly and um, talk about some of the other bits a bit more. Um, they're small schools for 14 to 19 year olds. We went for 14 to 19 because um, you can create a more adult environment in a school with children that age. If you have 11 and 12 year olds, it's not really an adult environment. And we wanted to try and do that. We wanted something that was a bit more like the workplace than like a school. There's a heavy use of project-based learning. As some of the other speakers have touched on today, um, not everybody learns very well the way that we conventionally teach in schools. I don't learn very well that way. I much prefer to find things out for myself, to work with other people. I don't like being told what to do. Um, I, I didn't enjoy secondary school for, for that reason. The students have um, a group of people I'll talk about in a second called personal coaches. And the personal coaches are designed to help them develop these interpersonal skills. Um, the reason that we've not asked teachers to do that, I, I guess a lot of people in this audience are teachers. Could you put your hand up if you're a teacher? I'm, I'm just going to insult you slightly here, I'm afraid. Um, the, there's a lot of research that shows that teachers lose their interpersonal skills at quite an early stage. Um, they don't have colleagues in the normal sense of having colleagues. Um, they are used to directing information down towards um, people. It's very directive and actually you lose some of these, these skills that you might have in a normal uh, workplace. Shoe schools have regular work experience, so regular and frequent at age of 16. They'll do two days a week with an employer outside the school. At the age of 14 and 15, they'll do perhaps a day a fortnight or half a day, half a day a week. And I'll touch on why that is later on. We have a skills framework um, here. Some of you might have seen it from our, our website. Um, we're not pretending it's a world leading um, skills framework. The difference between and many others though is that it's actually being used on a day-to-day -day basis. It's actually at the centre of the school. It's not a peripheral thing, it's not something people do in their spare time, it's bang in the centre of what's actually happening. So we've got these various um, skills and sub-skills and then we break them into um, a framework that allows you to track progress across different sub-skills. So if you think about something like um, how you relate to others, well, one of the sub-skills within that's collaboration. What does collaboration look like in different contexts? How can you actually measure progress over a period of time? Some of that is done by these 
personal coaches who we talked about. So when you go to a studio school, you're allocated a personal coach, and that personal coach stays with you through the entire time at the school. Um, they'll have one-to-one -one meetings with you where they'll talk about these great skills. They'll meet in small groups sometimes, but you'll see them regularly and you'll see them frequently. You can see them in an ad hoc basis. If you've got issues you want to talk about, you can go and talk to your personal coach in a way you might not go and speak to a teacher. Generally, we found that these are people with um, real-world experience. They're not teachers, by and large. Um, they're less expensive than teachers. Um, I've tried to quickly do the conversion. Um, you will not get a teacher of any sort in the United Kingdom for less than the equivalent of about 100,000 Brazilian reals a year. They're an expensive resource. You can actually get very good personal coaches for the equivalent of 50 or 60,000 um, Brazilian reals. And one of the things that allows us to do is it increases the um, staff to pupil ratio within the school. I've mentioned work experience. We, we think that's critically important. Um, work provides context for learning. If you think about things like um, geometry, geometry is conceptually difficult, conceptually difficult for a lot of people. But if you have to um, lay a, a course of bricks, for instance, angles suddenly start to mean something. You understand the, the impact of getting those angles wrong later on, and it actually starts to, to, to click in a way it, it might not otherwise. It's also an induction into the adult world. Um, we have increasingly kept our young people away from the adult world later and later. You can't leave school until you're 16 in Britain, um, and increasingly people are not leaving, in fact, till they're, they're 18. Their experience of the adult world is dealing with teachers and dealing with family. It's very poor preparation um, for, for, for work. I'll just play this very short video. One of the employers we're working with talking about what he's doing um, with the studio school. My ideal is to take a student on at the age of 14, give them work experience, to then take them on as an apprentice, to then take them on to a permanent role in the future, train them to be a fully qualified accountant. So we've got lots of employers, hundreds, thousands of employers working with studio schools up and down the land because what they're saying to us is these schools are providing exactly the set of skills that we need and we're prepared to engage with the school on that basis. I mentioned um, project-based learning um, earlier on. Um, we, we don't believe project-based learning is for everybody. Um, I know I was slightly disparaging there about the, the factory model, um, but actually there are some people who learn very well that way. I guess a lot of people in this room um, learn very well the way that we've typically taught in schools. Um, certainly all of our politicians and our policy makers have succeeded in that system, so they tend to think it's the best one. We, we agree that for some people it is, it is a good system. We also don't think it's possible to um, deliver an entire curriculum through project-based learning. We think some things don't lend themselves very well to that. So you should use fairly traditional methods. And I think it's also important that we remember um, the education system, certainly the one we work in, places a great deal of emphasis on succeeding in examinations. So studio schools can't work outside the system, They've got to, to work with it, and young people need qualifications. Single subject teaching is a good way to prepare young people to pass examinations. So at every studio school, although much of the curriculum is taught through project-based learning, there is a single subject reinforcement to prepare them for those examinations. Project-based learning has had a, a bit of a checkered history in, in England and I guess elsewhere. Certainly when I've talked to people from around Europe, that, that's, that's true. Because what's tended to happen is um, a teacher has come up with an interesting project that says, let's put on a Shakespeare play or let's, um, uh, let's put on a fashion show or something like that. The students are very enthusiastic about it. Um, there's lots of, of progress that's apparently made. And then suddenly, there's a horrible realization that nobody has mapped that to the requirements of the examination system. 
There's no point in doing a science project if the things that you're actually covering don't actually cover the requirements of the science exams that the children are going to have to sit. So there's a huge amount of very detailed planning has to go into um, project-based learning. And people have been lazy about that in the past. Um, we think that that's key. The, the benefits extend beyond the school. I mean, I don't have time to go into all of this, but one of the things that we found is that parents um, are telling you about quite dramatic changes of behaviour amongst their children. Um, their children are much more positive about learning. And, and actually, we're seeing some, we have a tiny evidence base, but we're seeing some early evidence, in fact, that boys are progressing faster using this method than, than they do in a traditional school. I'm just going to show you um, a short film. It's only three minutes long. We had a competition last year, and we asked um, studio school students from around our different schools to produce a short video without any um, help from staff, um, setting out what, what was their studio school, what made it special. Um, we've um, slowed down the video uh, slightly for the aid of the translators, um, because they are speaking very quickly. Um, so it may look a little bit jerky at times, but if you just take a few minutes just to watch this. Hi, I'm Talia, and before we begin, we would like to give you the story of the Creative and Media Studio School. The Studio School is a new concept of education, born in 2010, and the first ever Studio School opened all the way up in Huddersfield. Our Studio School takes the traditional learning and teaching method out of the classroom and puts it in a creative, practical and enterprising atmosphere. Our Studio School is a brilliant place where creative magic happens. Placements at the Studio School are a key part of academic excellence. In the real world, outside the big walls of the Studio School, businesses and paying clients will not accept C's. A stars is the only acceptable outcome. All Studio Schools follow the CREATE framework and this has been created to help students excel at their work. Personal coaching is a one-on-one -on -one meeting between a coach and a student that allows them to talk about the school life. It helps the students get more direction for their future career. Graham runs a youth marketing agency for young people between the ages of 14 and 19. Graham provides opportunities for students at the studio school to work with him on live projects for his clients. Not only do the students get the experience, but the work goes towards their coursework and they also often get paid, which is kind of cool. Hi, I'm Chris and I'm a media student at Studio School. During my first year at the Studio School, I used to work for Graham. Working for Graham, I used to make promotional films that would go towards his work with clients. Hello, I'm Matthew. The Studio School has helped me learn to build up my confidence and has given me the chance to expand my DJing company. Studying media with Mickey, my learning coach, and the rest of the team has given me a chance to be around like-minded people with the same passion as me. I felt a bit daunted by other colleges because I'm dyslexic and reading and writing really scares me. The relaxed and nurturing environment is a fantastic way for me to maximise my potential. Hi, I'm Ruben, a fashion student at the Studio School. I never thought I'd be working on a placement for a clothing company and conducting my own photo shoot. A big part of my time here was being able to direct a fashion show. All the subject areas came together to put on a brilliant showcase of the students' work. The graphic design students made the branding and promotional material, the media students filmed it and the music students provided soundtracks and entertainment. We even have Prince Andrew as an official patron of the Studio School's Trust. He visited us and gave enormous praise to both teachers and students and told us to not be afraid of making mistakes because that's just how we learn. The Studio School family is growing every day with schools popping up all over the country and we can't wait for you to join us.
So that was something that um, you know, three ordinary 16-year-olds managed to produce. So that, that was the winning entry in the competition, but they were all um, pretty good. The, the last thing really I want to, to finish off with is um, we believe that this is a model that's, that's transferable around the world. Um, and I just printed out from Google Analytics. It's not nearly as impressive as uh, Code Academy's six billion hits or, <laughs> or however many it was with Mike Bloomberg on there, I noticed. Um, but you can see um, th there's, there's a fair amount of interest from, from almost all over. I, I really don't know what Bolivia has against us, um, but uh, they, they don't go to our website, nor do North Korea, but we're not too bothered about that. Um, so I just want to finish by thanking you um, for listening to me here today, and uh, I hope that wasn't too disjointed. Thank you. Thank you.